nice to be here. Uh, well, you're right, we're going to have a lot of different topics this morning. And um, the students asked me if I would talk to them about um, what my recent work has been. And much of it in the last four or five years has been to try to develop a concept that I've called the shared ethics. And it doesn't mean that we can all agree on all our values, but it does mean that we need to try harder to find where we can agree and to have the experience of belonging to the same moral community. Although we'll belong to that with different people depending on what the issue is that we're talking about. And if you'd like to know more about that, here's an advertisement. You can read about it in two of my books, The Ethical Canary, and the other one is called The Ethical Imagination. But what I want to do in this very short time that we have is to look, yeah, probably we might only get through one of these areas, but if possible, two. Children's human rights, which involves our intangible or metaphysical environment of values. And I think we're going to have a great deal of difficulty finding a shared ethics in this area. You only have to look at, the, you want to look at this morning's newspapers to see how much is in them. Um, and the other one, if we have time, is climate change where I actually think we can rather easily probably find a shared ethics. So let's first of all look at children's human rights. What we have to ask here is, this is a very controversial area, and some of you will know I've been in no end of trouble <coughs> having waded into it. And um, what it's to do with is children's human rights regarding their biological identity, their family structure, and their biological origins. And all of those are under challenge at the moment. And um, there's some old and new phenomena, older adoptions old, new reproductive and genetic technologies and same-sex marriage <coughs> are new. And all of those things are affecting children's rights within these regards. And the reason that they all do that is that adoption, uh, new reproductive technologies and same-sex marriage all unlink child-parent biological bonds. They all have an impact on what those bonds are. And we've long dealt with adoption in that regard, but we now are dealing with this because of the use of new reproductive technologies. And in the last 30 years, that's become a major issue for the people who've been born as a result of the use of these technologies. And most recently, uh, we've got the issue of same-sex marriage that's bringing up uh, this, these same questions. So what we have to ask is, um, sorry, that's, what are our obligations to children with respect to these origins? What do we as a society owe them? And what protections do they need? And the first one that I want to look at is children's rights to know the identity of their biological parents. It's one matter for children not to know their genetic identity because of unintended circumstances. It's quite another matter ethically to deliberately destroy children's links to their biological parents and for society to be complicit in that. Now, I don't know whether you know, but there's a young woman in British Columbia called Olivia Pratton who's just launched a lawsuit against the British Columbia government demanding that they open her sperm donor, the sperm donor record so that she can know who her biological father is. And uh, she's taking that lawsuit on behalf of other children who are in the same position. These young people call themselves donor conceived adults. The largest group of them in the world are in Australia because the original in vitro fertilization clinic that was set up very shortly after the birth of Louise Brown, the first test tube baby, was actually set up at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. And that, since the internet, these young people have contacted each other and um, <coughs> what they have uh, been doing is very forcefully arguing both to recover their own identity if they can and also that it is wrong to do this to future children. And as well during this period, we've recognized that adopted children have got the right to know where they came from, who their biological parents are. And so these children are claiming that they've got the same rights. In fact, the suit in British Columbia will be run 
on the grounds that it is wrongful discrimination against donor inseminated children as compared with adopted children because adopted children now have the right to know who their, who their uh, biological parents were. And when you talk to these children, who they're now adults, when you talk to them, you can see that they have powerful feelings of loss of identity. Uh, they tell you things like, I look in the mirror and half of me is missing. I walk down the street, I look at every man I pass and think, would he be my father? Uh, they call themselves genetic orphans. And they say, uh, one of the powerful things that they said to me was, how could society ever have thought that it had the right to do this to us? And yet, that's what we did. We didn't, somehow we didn't think about it in, uh, in that way. So one of the things is that we, we haven't looked at this and we need to look at it and we have to listen to these young people who are telling us what's wrong. One of the ethical doctrines here is what's called the doctrine of anticipated consent. What that says is that when you're going to do something uh, that the person who will be most affected by it can't give their consent, because in this case they don't exist, uh, can you reasonably anticipate that if they were present and were asked for their consent, they would give it? And very strongly what these people say is, no, I wouldn't give my consent. So we can't anticipate consent to anonymous <coughs> donation, and therefore I think we have to take steps to do something about that. One of these young people, Joe Rose, who's actually doing a PhD thesis on this at the Queensland University of Technology, someone challenged her, who was very annoyed with her carrying on about having the right to know who her, her sperm donor was, and said, look, would you, you really should just be grateful to that sperm donor. If it wasn't for him, you wouldn't be standing here causing all this trouble for us. <laughs> and uh, she looked at him, I thought, I thought, well, that's a pretty tough question to answer. She looked at him and she said, well, she said, if I was a, if I was a product of rape, I wouldn't be standing here either, but that doesn't mean that I approve of rape. And I thought that was an excellent response to this. Um, ethics, human rights, and international law, and the health and well-being of children require knowing about your biological parents. And it's not just these children that have got that right, it's also their future descendants. When we're finding that they most want to know where they came from, the way I put it is through whom the thread of life's passage gave, came down the generations to them. It's when they're going to have children themselves. These young people are all in their mid-twenties now. And they say, well, I'm going to do to my child what was done to me. They won't know any further back than me who, are, who are they are. So that's the first thing that I think that we have to do. And so we should, I believe we should have a law that prohibits anonymous uh, sperm and over donation, establishes a donor registry, and recognizes children's rights to know the identity. The second one is children's rights to both a mother and a father. And this is where we cross into same-sex marriage. And this is enormously contentious. The reason that same-sex marriage brings up this issue is because under both international and national law, marriage is not just a single right and it's not just a right for adults. Marriage is a compound right. It's the right to marry and found a family. And so what is now happening is that the argument will be, it's quite possible it will be in our Supreme Court of Canada because the Court of Appeal of uh, Quebec has ruled that part of the uh, Assisted Human Reproduction Act, which is a federal act governing new reproductive technologies in Canada, is unconstitutional, uh, as Minister Priyad would know. And the reason they held this was that health is a provincial jurisdiction. The Quebec government challenged the federal government passing criminal law on this matter, saying that was trespassing on provincial jurisdiction. And the Quebec Court of Appeal has agreed largely that the vast majority of provisions in this act are unconstitutional. So it remains to be seen what the Supreme Court of Canada will say. 